I disgust you. What is up, everybody? Welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. Welcome, in fact, to PCP Movie Night. Welcome, even more, in fact, to Horror Fest 2023. We're about at the halfway point right now, and I am more than beyond excited. More than beyond excited here tonight to talk tonight about The Brood by David Cronenberg, written and directed by one of our favorite directors last year for Horror Fest. We did Videodrome. And that movie gave me nightmares for a week. So I was like, let's bring on the nightmares for everybody else. Let's talk about The Brood, which I do consider to be the first truly brilliant and great film from David Cronenberg. I think it's aged exceptionally well. I'm excited to get into this movie. I hope you had a chance to watch it, PCP Army, because here tonight on PCP Movie Night, we're talking about David Cronenberg's the Brood. Of course, I am your host, Rockin' Robbie Bills. Joining me tonight is the one and the only, the Jelani. What is up, my man? What the hell do you have me watch? <laughs> a Cronenberg <laughs> film, bro. Yeah, dude. I'm, I'm glad I'm here because we're going to have a wildly discussion about what the hell I just watched. <laughs> so I love times. it, man. Dude, I think this is the best Horror Fest lineup I personally have ever come up with for PCP Movie Night because it starts fun small and simple and it just keeps getting gnarlier and gnarlier as the weeks progress you will see speaking of getting gnarlier and gnarlier as the weeks progress this dude ain't showered or bathed in eight months and it's getting crazy verno how are you doing that's not a light by the way that's the smell yeah (laughs) let me just say how well i know you as soon as you start saying the word gnarly i'm like oh he's gonna do he's gonna call me gnarly wait it's coming up so what up man so i'm excited to be here with you guys happy horror fest Speaking of always excited to be here, it's Brooks. Hey. Hey. How you doing, man? It's good. Yeah, me too. God, All right. Yeah, I'm glad. Yeah. Speaking of being glad, I am glad that we have somebody with some energy coming up next. It's Fable from One Collection Down. What is up, my hey, man? Hey, shit. What's going on, brothers? <laughs> You got enough energy for all of us, man. <laughs> <laughs> you should have seen me this weekend, bro. <laughs> Poor Nick and Eric didn't even get the full experience, man. Memphis was very low key compared to where we could have wound up in a strip club in the fucking outside of the city somewhere if it was in Orlando. You never know. You never know. Anyway, thank you for being here, Fable. It's 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 always a pleasure to have you here, my man. But another person it's always to have a pleasure with because I love the way this dude dissects movies in his mind, the way he can articulate that, and the way he also likes to talk shit about other people's opinions. It's our man, Steph, from Missing Link. What is up, Link? Wow. <laughs> what up, Link, Link's coming at us straight from the county lockdown. I hope everything's all right, man. Tell him, tell him you wanted to take your breathalyzer again. <laughs> Love you, bro. All right. Tonight we're talking about 1979's The Brood. All right. So Cronenberg, we were discussing this a little bit backstage. Cronenberg, by the way, you out there in the chat, thank you so much for being here. We'll get to your comments. We'll be throwing them up on the screen. All that stuff. I see you introspect him. I see you castle. Spilio, how you doing? The first time watched for Spilio. I see GT. Uh, Who else is here? Where's Two Gun? Where's Two Gun? It's not Horror Fest till Two Gun shows up. Pew, pew. Anyway, he's on his way. His ears are ringing right now. All right, 1979. This dude has already made two short films um, that he thought were going to like get him some like attention. Like Crimes of the Future was one of them. I can't remember the name of the other one. Do you remember Verno? No. Well, these two move. These two short films apparently scared everybody off from this dude, right? And at the time where they were really trying to get the Canadian film industry rocking and a rolling right they're doing these tax deductions these tax breaks these these tax havens whatever the hell it is they're doing all this kind of stuff uh no thank you mcavy i just had a freaking pop-up anyway so he, he they're doing all these tax shelters that's the term right to, to like promote this canadian film industry right and we've had the smashing success of black christmas by bob clark already at this point and they're trying to get more of this stuff going on we've had them dabble with shivers and rabid with david cronenberg and then he's planning on a movie that will ultimately become scanners the movie that comes after this right but while he's trying to write scanners this idea is in his head and the idea becomes the brood and the brood to me 
I watched this movie for the first time in my early 20s. I was getting into Cronenberg cinema. I had heard about Videodrome. I had seen The Fly my entire life, never made a connection that there was a dude who was responsible for that. I just thought The Fly was a super awesome, gnarly movie, right? But then when you find out, oh, it's this dude, he did Videodrome. And I watched Videodrome and like was obsessed with that movie for a while. Didn't have nightmares back in my early 20s. In my early 40s, though, that movie gives me nightmares, probably because there's more I've unearthed about myself. Anyway, um, also the way our, our, relation to, our relationship to media has changed since I last watched it. It makes that movie more like, that's something about Cronenberg films. They're like good when they first release, but they have a life. Like some of the themes in Videodrome, the themes in Scanners, the themes in The Fly, the themes in this movie, they still ring out true today, right? Like Shivers seems like it belongs in the early 90s with Arsenio Hall and Magic John telling everybody wear a condom. You know, it feels like that's <laughs> going on in that film. This to me is the first great Cronenberg film. I feel like everything was finally actualized. His vision finally came through. And after making three movies before this, three features before this, he was able to kind of do that. He told this story, which was he says is the most personal story that he's ever told because David Cronenberg was going through a divorce with a woman who was in what he considered to be a cult, right? And he had to go and rescue his daughter from that cult. Right. Or maybe his child. I don't remember if it was a daughter or, or a son, but like he had to go rescue his child from a cult, like went on a plane and in and, and Canada, flew to L.A. or somewhere in California, grabbed his, his, his girl up, his child up and flew back. Right. That's something you see in the beginning of this film. This is a very mm -hmm. personal film that really intellectually, in my opinion, dissects a lot of themes. It dissects the whole idea of psychology and self-help, how tremendously helpful that can be to a lot of people but also how kind of like it's a double-edged sword because there's a lot of like phonies that play in that territory and a lot of vulnerable people that are patients of said territory right mm -hmm. this movie hits all those themes you got one of howard shore's first compositions ever i know that brooks is gonna have some stuff to say about the music because this is the dude that did the music for peter jackson and the lord of the rings trilogy so it's cool to see his start I love this film. I this love his it. first movie doing the soundtrack. It's one of his first movies, if not his first movie. But he wound up doing a lot of films with uh, with Cronenberg, including Videodrome, which we talked about last year. Um, I think this movie is brilliant. I watched it with a very good friend of mine on Friday. It was the first time that she had ever seen it, and she said, "I love." this film and it was a great rewatch first of all because of the company there so shout outs to jamie everybody but this movie just rocks dude when i watched it in my early 20s it hit me i watched the brood and scanners like back to back right like when i found out that this one dude had done the fly and did the, these other movies i watched videodrome got into that movie and then i watched brood and scanners like back to back and that shit literally blew my mind no pun intended if you've seen scanners hmm. but i'm a huge fan of this film I think it's an undersung, underappreciated film from David Cronenberg. And I do think it's his first brilliant film, his first true classic. And being that early in your career, bruh, that's pretty exceptional to me, especially in this industry at that time in 1979. I think this movie, you ready for this? I think it's better than Alien. Oh, all right, let's move on. All right, let's move on, everybody. Whoa, now, that, whoa, now, that, whoa. now that the hot takes are out of the way, <laughs> holy, holy shit, Lady, <laughs> that is a hot damn take. What do you think about this movie, The Brood? Your first time watching, by the way. I just said that to get everybody riled up. By the way, mm. nah, I think I would did. have to really think about it if I was going to make that bold ass <laughs> statement. But I don't know, man. I don't know. This lady licked a bloody baby that came out of her <laughs> external stomach. This is Cronenberg to the max. This is some shit that I was like, I have to curse a lot because this this is some crazy shit. I, I It was slow for me. This is one of these movies where it was very, it wasn't slow burn because I kind of knew, I was like, wait, it's, it's Cronenberg, so something's going to jump out of somebody's body. Or we're gonna get some crazy shit out of out of people's body in general, like a like like a scrotum in your neck. It, it, it it's one of these movies where you're just watching it and you're like you're waiting for the Cronenberg because I know what Cronenberg did because the fly has fly ruined me as a child. 
<laughs> like I don't I haven't watched that movie like since I was a child. I don't want I don't want to watch it again. Like the fly <laughs> two came out, I heard it was trash. I think I may have watched it, but I can't remember if I did because I was like I remember what the fly was and like how his uh, how his face fell apart. I don't want to watch that again. No, pass. I'm good. <laughs> this this is one of these movies where I mean, yes, it's psychological. It's about psychotherapy and what it can do and, and how psychosemantics. I'm a psychology major. Um, so I understand the concept of it and I understand the beginning. At first, I thought it was a skit play, but it was actually that guy's session that he's having in front of a, a ton you of people. You thought it was a comedy troupe? Like, I thought it was a troupe. He's like, on. yeah. I really thought some crazy improv that was happening. I was like, what the hell is this? And then I realized it was a session. I was like, what the hell are you doing a session in front of all these other people? This that would be a, a comedy improv bit today, though. The whole, like, the yeah. whole, daddy, I can't look at you, daddy. I, I could if I yeah. wanted to, but I, <laughs> I can't. It's like, I'll call you Michelle. <laughs> what? what? And it's just, it's one of these movies that makes you think afterwards. Um, so, uh, Video Drone does the same thing, although Video Videodrome still gives me nightmares. Um, it's it's just one of those things. It was too meta for me. But this movie is is absolutely wild. I cannot believe that you made me watch it. Um, and Station, there I'm done. Because good God, <laughs> good God. I thought about it for longer than ten seconds. That statement may not be true to me personally that this is better than Alien, but it's up there with it for me, right? It's something that I think in 1979, you got these movies coming out like Alien. This some this is something that should be mentioned, in my opinion, up there with it. And by the way, 62 Lefty Blues, I saw you. I got to meet you in person this week. It was super, super cool. I left your number at the hotel room when we went out, and I feel bad about it, bro, because I really wanted to hang out with you, man. But we'll do it next time, baby. Next time. Terrence Howard, by the way, never showed back up for War, War Machine after he said that. Um, I appreciate your thoughts, Jelani. Um, this is a wild movie to watch, but it is a little bit of a slow movie, but everything keeps building up. And a lot of Cronenberg movies are kind of built upon the premise of showing you shocking things, right? And giving you like disturbing imagery throughout. Like Videodrome is not a slow movie. That shit gets right no, it to just it, happens. you know? But Scanners yeah. is kind of like this too. Scanners kind of like... Mm -hmm builds itself but i can't think of another but film it's not as and i haven't seen as this is okay well i haven't seen that. everything from davy c but mm -hmm. this is one of the only ones i can think of that truly builds tension and suspense mm. all the way through and i remember the first time i watched it i didn't know necessarily fully what was up until the end and every other time i've watched it you just pick up on every little thing speaking of picking up on every little thing verno Doing a great job over at Blood Splatter Chatter. Go check them out. Link in the description below. The third partner of Horror Fest 2023. That's right, 2023. We got three <laughs> channels involved. Yeah, we've planned that. I've been planning that shit for fucking 23 years. Anyway. <laughs> Bruno, you're the only other person on this panel who have seen this film. What do you think about it, man? I... It's a weird ass film, man. This has been like the year for Cronenberg for me. <laughs> like I, he's a guy just like what you were saying earlier. Like when I was a kid, I grew up, loved the fly, never realized there was a human being making that movie. You know, I never thought about it. <laughs> so really since I got like into the PCP family and like when you did video drum, I'm like, oh, I checked that out. Loved it. Fell absolutely in love with it. I covered Shivers. That to me, like, I love Shivers. That's his first movie. By the way, the ones that he did before, and I looked it up, Stereo and Crimes of the Future, That's which he right. just did Stereo. a remake of Crimes in the Future recently, which by it's supposed to be like only by by name only. It has nothing to do with the old movie. But and there's a Criterion Blu-ray, I think, or some Blu-ray, maybe it's Arrow, that you can get of his early short films, by the way. No, oh, okay. This one... I watched this after I had watched those two films that I was talking about going on my little Cronenberg uh, binge like a year ago. I watched this, and when you put it up for Horror Fest, I was like, ah, I don't want to jump on that one because I didn't love it. And I'm like, you know me. I usually need to watch a movie twice, and I'm way into Cronenberg now, so I'm like, oh, this is probably going to blow me away. I'm with Jelani when I'll say it's fucking, it's pretty slow, man. I, I kind of struggled with a lot of it. I think it's super fucking interesting. And you, mm -hmm. by the end of this show, Robbie, you're going to tell me 
even more how interesting it is. And I'm sure I'll appreciate it more <laughs> the next time. I'm, no, I mean it. But like, like I love the beginning of the movie and I love the end of the movie. Like talk about Cronenberg and the shock, shocking scenes. His earlier movies he does before this, he puts those scenes up front. With this, he does like a very interesting scene up front, but he holds off on the shock value. The main shock value is until the very, very end. So the beginning, the end, I love the bit in the middle where it's kind of like a slasher movie. There's cool bits and there's constantly new thematic material, which I know we're going to get into. That's brought up, but it's like, oh, that's interesting. But I find myself most of the movie like thinking about the themes almost too much and never getting wrapped up in the story personally. So, you know, it might be one of those movies that it might take three times for me. And it's a super interesting movie. But uh, to me, I like Shivers and I like Rabid that came out before this more. Shivers, my favorite out of those three, then Rabid and then this. And in my opinion, they're better movies, if that makes sense. They're more well-made films, but I fucking Shivers the shit to me. Like, I love that movie. I swear to God, if this becomes 2023's Funhouse, I'm going to fucking never have any of y'all on this show again. Get the fuck out of here. Uh, hey, hey, I'm not saying it's terrible. Let's get out I'm of here. Saying I, don't, is trash. I don't see what you see in the movie yet. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't grip me and, like, entertain me throughout it. Like, I'm not, like, as into it as I am his other work. I agree. I agree with you. Get the fuck out of here. All right. Anyway, Brooks, what do you think about this film? First time watching I, I like it pretty well. It's a good, it's a very good suspense movie. Like you said, when you said that, you know, this was a personal movie from that makes sense. Like, I'm not really surprised because it does feel like, you know, this is a movie kind of like based off his own experiences and fears, you know, about his own, maybe his own child or even his own, like, you know, parenting abilities. But yeah, there's definitely like a lot to this movie. Like it's really, uh, it's really interesting and it has some really good, uh, like visual scenes, you know, of course, as you would expect from a Cronenberg movie. But the one that sticks in my head most is like an early one. It's, it's like a very simple thing. It's like, you know, when the first time one of the tumor kids attacks somebody and the daughter sees him at the top of the staircase, and he puts his hands yeah. on the railings and he leaves the blood prints. Yeah. Was, By like, the way, I, tumor kids sounds like a great sitcom that we should develop. <laughs> yes. <laughs> The tumor kids. It's a it's a spinoff of Kindergarten Cop. (laughs) (laughs) It's not a tumor. tumor. It was a tumor. It was a tumor. (laughs) Gosh, oh man! I'd watch it though. So you liked it, Brooks? You liked it? Yeah. Yeah. Fuck yeah! All right, all right. We're not in we're not in Funhouse territory fully yet, so that's (laughs) nice. Okay, I appreciate that. Fable, you're scaring me, bro. What do you think, man, about this film? <laughs> Prepare for the fun house. No. <laughs> oh, no, I got to I gotta echo a lot of what Verno said. Um, this movie is a little bit slow. It was hard for me to get through a little bit. It, there's not enough there for me to hang on to to, to try to get through it. But... um. I disagree with you in the sense that uh, Shivers is better. I think this is better than Shivers. Um, what I see with him, Cronenberg, because I'm like you guys. Fly was my first uh, introduction to Cronenberg, and then Video Drone, and then everything past that, right? Everything going forward. Nothing really behind that, except Scanners. Except Scanners. Scanners was probably Scanners. The, yeah. Probably Scanners was first, but I didn't know it was Cronenberg. Right. Let's put it like that, mm-hmm. right? So. Um, everything before I've never seen. So now I've seen Shivers and I've seen this and I see the progression. I see him working towards Scanners, right? Like I see him working toward and Scanners in itself is also working towards the fly where I think that's where he just breaks out, right? Like he, he, he becomes cohesive in every single way. Everything he tries to do in these first five or six films, it's a progression of his style. And um, this one compared to Shivers is definitely more now we're getting to video drone. You know what I mean? Now we got the 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 sick prosthetics. Um and they're looking really good because that lady that whatever yeah. she had on her, that looked pretty gnarly. Like that was pretty good. I don't know who who, who made that up for her, but it, it looked pretty dope. So um I'm gonna say that it's an interesting movie. It's a provocative movie. Um but it's just not quite there yet. So still a little too slow for me. So yeah I'm there. I'm mad with it. Would would you say that Scanners though has that kind of same structure though, where it like kind of slowly starts building up to the big big moments, right? 
Yeah, but 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 you see, like, have you seen Shivers, by the way? Yeah, I actually was on the show with Berno. That was the first oh, time okay. I had watched it, actually. All right, yeah, okay. So you were you were there with? I think. Um, no, you were. That was the three of us. I was I was like, yeah, oh, okay. you were there. I wasn't no, there was, for Shivers. <laughs> no, it was me, Fable, and Link. We, you and I, I did. Swear, a, I thought wow. it was on. I was on. We Shivers. did Brandon Cronenberg's movie Look, Possessor. What I. I should have been I, there, and I would have set you all straight. Is what I'm saying. <laughs> what, what I what I noticed with him is that he he likes to tell these weird ass tales, but like he doesn't he he gives you everything towards the end. And so far, yeah. like in Shivers and in this movie, he does it again. He dumps everything at the end, and what's in the beginning that leads up to it might not be enough for some people. It wasn't enough for me, you know. So that yeah, I'll just say Matt. Also well, agree. Well, one thing I've learned is that memory is a bitch, man. Because I swear to God, I thought I was on that Shivers video for some reason. Man. I don't know where that came from, bro. You got Jesus. me checking. I'm like, what the fuck? I know. I saw you look at like, what, Rob? What did Robbie just say? And I was like, what do you mean? What do you mean? And I was like, oh shit, I wasn't there. No, I watched it this year though, so maybe that's why I'm, I'm confused. I swear, I, thought, I should. We should redo it. We should redo Shivers yeah, and hey, Rabbit. We've we'll never. Do it. Nobody's done Rabbit yet, right? Negative. Ah, well, there's the next one. Speaking of rabid, I'm rabid to hear what Steph has to think <laughs> about this movie. Link, what did you think about your first viewing of The Brood? Uh, I enjoyed it. it I, I agree with these guys, though. It was a r rather on the, um, the slower side, but once I kind of got what it was going for, I was down for it, but I do agree, like everything was kind of built towards the, the, the end, and it's like if you don't, the end doesn't hit you, it's kind of like a waste of journey or a waste of time some for some people. But um I liked it. I I thought there's some cool themes going on with it. Uh specifically um people taking on other people's monsters sometimes. Like you know, if you care about someone so much, you think you can help someone battle through a their their darkness, whatnot, and um maybe they're not equipped for that job. I thought, you know, there's something going on with that, but uh, it was interesting. And the, the the kids reminded me of like Children of the Corn, so that was cool. So like the um the whole blonde, mm -hmm. no, not Children of the Corn, but uh, what's what's the one where they're all blonde Village and they like the have dam. powers? Village Village of the dam. Dam. Yeah. Yes. That's good. So chance. I thought that was cool. But uh, overall, I I enjoyed it. I it's I don't think it's uh I couldn't say it's one of my favorite works of his but i respect it for being a you know one of his first films all right all right we are we are not in funhouse territory we're still, <laughs> we're still doing good for horror fest 2023 that's great not even brooks was impressed with sleepaway camp so you can't win them all right so there you go all right um the cast i think this movie has an exceptional cast and normally i uh well normally i do go first because you know i i want to take the good pick but especially knowing that I probably love this movie more than the rest of you, I'm going to go. My favorite performance is by Oliver Reed because I love Oliver Reed. He plays the doctor in the movie. He's developing this form. And one of the things I love about this movie is it does not take you, the audience, for granted. It knows that you are smart. It knows that you can connect the dots and piece shit together. That doesn't go out of its way to explain what's going on as the story is progressing, right? But very early on, we get that this dude, what is it, psychoplasmics? Is that what he calls it? Something yeah. like that, right? He's basically corralling people into getting their, their rage out. He, he, he gets these people like just built up into this. He wants them to like bring out their rage. And, it, and it's so much so that it brings out like physical marks in their body, right? Like they start developing like these boils Sores. or these marks on their body. And then another dude in the movie develops some form of weird ball sack on his throat yeah. cancer. Right. Yeah. And then you have the, the, the ultimate reveal of the movie where this woman is literally giving birth to little children of rage. You know what I'm saying? Of her rage. And she can direct them out towards the people that she has these repressed feelings and emotions about like her parents, right? Like, like her lover's teacher, who she thinks is she's having he's having an affair with her right to, towards her own child right and it's dealing with that and Oliver Reed an amazing performance right all the way through this dude was well known to be a raging alcoholic there was even a moment where 
one of the producers got a call like, yo, you got to come get your boy. He's at the jail cell right now. He was getting drunk with people at the bar, bet somebody that he would walk home nude. And now he's at the police station. But don't worry. Everybody's loving him and he's cracking them up. Right. But he was like a notorious alcoholic. It was just part of his legacy. Last movie I think he was in was uh, Ridley Scott's Gladiator. Gladiator mm-hmm. Right. But what I remembered him from as a kid and going forward was Curse of the Werewolf, the Hammer film. He's the werewolf in that film, bruh. And he is absolutely freaking amazing in that film. He's amazing here. I love his performance. I love how he plays a character that at first we're like, who is this dude? He's a charlatan. He's selling like a snake oil, right? He's doing all this kind of stuff. But then by the end of the movie, he kind of has that like face turn, but it actually works because of the way that he's bringing that gravitas to the role. And they even said though, even with his offset antics, he was always a professional on set. So that's really cool. Speaking of always a professional on set, but crazy offset. How about you, Jelani? What's a character you want to highlight in this film? Yeah, that's a fact. Um, well, I'm gonna go with the guy with the, the throat cancer, the ball sack. I can't remember his name. Um I don't know, but he's suing. Oh, the dude with the ball the sack cancer? Yeah, with the ball that sack. That dude's cancer. in rabid. What is his name? It's uh uh, I'll find it. Keep going. But uh, he's he's great in this movie. Like the first time you meet him, he's in a room rolling on the floor. <laughs> like <laughs> he's try. I don't. He's you gotta keep moving. You gotta keep rolling. You can keep living. And he wants to sue the doctor and get and expose him for being some kind of you know kook charlatan, like you're saying. And he. I, I don't know who that guy is, but I love that wicked come over. That it's was the Robert A. Silverman, over. by the way. Yeah. He was okay. also in Existence, Naked mm-hmm. Lunch, Scanners, The Brood, Rabbit. He's been in a bunch of Cronenberg films. Yeah. Well, I, I, he was I in the Friday tell. the 13th uh, series for two episodes, apparently, as well. And in Waterworld. <laughs> oh, <Lord. Why> not? <laughs> and Jason X. Oh, man, what a great... Wow, let me, we've seen him. What, what a great run. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Jason freaking X. Best kill in all. Anyway, but yeah, I liked I liked him. Uh, he was just a kooky guy, you know, next to the the guy that was like whiny. He he's just as crazy. I think they were both just as crazy. It's just he he, he held he held this shit together a little bit more. And yeah. um, an honorable mention, real quick. I, I know I want to pick two, but I'm I'm gonna pick like the first kid. <laughs> uh, for the first whatever the fuck that thing the was. first broodling or whatever the, the hell first right broodling. yeah yeah if somebody takes it i apologize but or that was somebody's pick i apologize but that thing oh my god like a i know <laughs> a it was so messed up b it was you could beat that thing that lady <laughs> could throw that thing across a room what how in the hell are you gonna bludgeon me you can't bludgeon me. You, you give me one good hit, oh, sure, but you ain't got me enough to be whoop your little your little ass brute ass ass. I'm gonna whoop your ass. <laughs> Trust. Trust. You hit me once, okay? You got me. After that, it's over. It's a wrap. Oh, it's a little thing. You dead. One of my favorite <laughs> shots in the film is when two of the like the broodlings or whatever like grab uh, candy and they're like walking her down the road, right? And they're wearing these like jumpsuits. One's yellow, one's red, one's blue. I looked at Jamie. I was like, it's fucking Power Rangers. She goes, I thought they were the Teletubbies. But like, I watched one video. They were like, by the way, do you think like in Canada, kids, people just attack kids in these fucking snow suits for the next year after watching this movie? Not me, motherfucker. Just like fucking going to town. Uh, And then that teacher, oh, that teacher getting attacked by him. And you like, oh no, you throw them motherfuckers. Uh Uh-uh, I'm throwing you. There's no I, I think they're playing with the close. idea that nobody wants to attack a kid. I think they're I think they're playing with those ideas. I don't know. I, I buy it a little bit more than you. Kid in the throat. <laughs> the second it came that close to me with a with a mini hammer, talking about you gonna come at me. It's your last day. It's your last. Come at me. It's There's a good reason day. Jelani doesn't have kids. Everybody, <laughs> this is it. Oh yeah. All right, I'm- Berno. What's a performance you want to highlight and carry the show through for a moment, please? Gotcha. I will just say, I thought about you while I was watching this, Jelani, 
Like, <laughs> like almost like the first line of the movie with that little girl. She, her acting comes out. I was like, oh boy, Jelani's gonna fucking love this. I don't even but, hate her. <laughs> that's surprising. I don't hate the kid. I that's hate the good. brood. I hate the brood. I don't hate the kid because the kid didn't say shit. She wasn't goofy. <laughs> yeah. She didn't do goofy shit. She, she was a normal five year old child that was having like. Some things, but I'm right. sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. You're great. But yeah. I, I am also. I'm so glad that neither of you picked the the two characters that I wanted to talk about. Well, the dude Robbie picked is my favorite in the movie. Like he crushes it. The doctor, his performance from the get go, is just so good and creepy and and weird. But the mom, I don't know if it's Nola or Nala, the woman mm-hmm. at the end played by Samantha Egger. It's just when I think about this movie, that's always the image, obviously, that's going to come to my mind. And she is the perfect casting for it, just on her face alone. She's got the voice and the acting chops for it, but the bone structure in this woman's face is so like beautiful and alien and freaky looking at the same time. Mm-hmm. It's just her licking the baby. I don't know. She's just the perfect choice for it. She kills it. Her accent's great for it, too. So, yeah. And she's like the cover of the movie. She's the thumbnail you see on HBO. Like, just her look. Even she doesn't even have blood on her mouth in that look. Just her look is fucking crazy and creepy looking. So I'll definitely go with her. Where you at on it, Brooks? I, th- I think my favorite would probably be the Tumor Boys. Like, just, just any of them <laughs> in general. Like, I, I, it's like, it's, it's such a, it's, 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 it's almost funny watching these tiny little, like, uh, child-looking like wearing the, you know, the big puffy jacket and everything, just like decimate and destroy these grown adults and like them being just completely helpless against them. Like it's so, br- they're like, they're so brutal. Like, you know, and I love the the scene where the dude leaves the handprints on the, the stair rails with the, the blood. It's like, it's like the, the idea of them is just so bizarre too. They're like, they're like uh, growths up from this woman's like weird psychological experiments that like have like a little sack on their back that it's like a battery that fuels them only for a little while until they just die. They're like birds kind of because they don't have like they come out of kind of an egg. It's like it's just a, a, a bizarre but like very interesting idea for a, a kind of horror creature for a movie like this. Absolutely, Verna. Who did you say? Uh, the mom. Okay. Yeah. Like the the brood mom. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, you disgust me. (laughs) All right. What about you, Fable? Who do you want to highlight? Uh, I I was going to highlight the ball sack neck guy. Um, I thought he was uh, particularly fantastic as well, but um, I'll go with the teacher. He's doing all those weird calisthenics or whatever. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) This towel around his neck just adds to the whole thing. And I did the same thing. I was like, what's what's this guy from? And I looked up his filmography. I'm like, oh, he's from nothing. What the hell? How do I how do I feel like I know this guy? But um yeah, he was great. But I'll go with the teacher. Um because she um she kept it the realest in the movie to me where she was like, hey, your life is a little too much for me right now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she left. I no felt shit. it so much. <laughs> Don't answer so the phone. I'll go with her for that one. Yeah, the phone a bit too. And she was like, Yeah, you bitch. She's like, Oh really? Okay. She's so like, you bitch. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, I'll go with the teacher. All right. She's I actually like her in the film, and I think her her death scene is actually really, really powerful to me, right? Like being bludgeoned to get death by in front of all those kids. He puts like one of their drawings over her fucking face. (laughs) Some kid is never going to fucking be okay (laughs) after that, right? Like that was my drawing, like draped over the dead corpse of my kindergarten teacher i don't know man it's a little too much man uh what about you steph what's a uh character performance you want to highlight uh i'll go with the dad uh felt his plight uh you know he realized he was in over his head but he was committed and he saw things through saved his little girl it he, he you know his struggle was believable you know he had frustration at the situation, you know, but at the same time, he uh, he manned up and just did what we had to do. Yeah, uh, that art, that uh, Art Hendel is that the, the the actor's name. He was in Black Christmas, by mm-hmm. the way. Yeah, no, I think I think wearing that same jacket. That's his jacket. 
that he rocks. He said he's more than a handful of movies. <laughs> I can believe it. It's true. I, he says it in the special features for uh, Black Christmas. <laughs> he's awesome, by the way. He's a super funny, dude. Wow. We thought you were just doing a bit, making a joke, man. No, you for real. You for real, man. No, that's his jacket. It's in every goddamn film. It's like that Sam Raimi car. All right. Um, let's talk about the style and structure. I think it's absolutely brilliant. So the cinematography is done by Mark Irwin, who did a lot of work with David Cronenberg from this point forward. He did Scanners. He did Videodrome. He did Dead Zone. He did The Fly. And it keeps going on. He did the Blob movie that y'all just talked about, right? Mm. Which is a great movie, mm. and I appreciate it way more now than I did when I covered it on DHS. But the Blob is great. Y'all had a really great show about that. Everybody go check out the Blob on Blood Splatter Chatter. Check out their Shivers um, conversation without me and, uh, and it will all be good. So I think that this is the first time that David Cronenberg actualizes his vision. I think there's some really brilliant stuff and ideas in shivers and in rabid, but I don't think that it completely connects or executes in the proper way. I do love those films. Okay. I love David Cronenberg. Everything that I've seen, I haven't seen everything. Like I haven't seen Dead Ringers, for for instance. I've never mm. seen that film. I've never seen Naked Lunch, but I've seen these movies. I've seen Eastern Promises and uh, History of Violence, some of his newer films. Um, I think that this is the first time where he was uh, like, there's something in the script that's more than just a statement he's trying to make. It's very personal to him. We already talked about like him going through divorce. To me, this movie is a movie about divorce and how it affects kids, how it affects the adults going through it, but how it affects the kids in particular. And I think it's actually a very powerful film. And I love, I love that structurally, he's not hitting us all in the face with it at first. I love that he's like allowing us to make certain connections. Even after the movie, some of these connections we have to make ourselves, but they actually make them in the film, but it's just a visual thing or a sequence of events type thing. It's not like exposition. This is a brilliant case of show, don't tell for me. Even though there is a lot of telling in this movie, they don't tell you everything. And it doesn't take the audience for granted. I love that about the writing. I think all of his writing, even Shivers and Rabbit, I'm not talking shit about those movies. I think they're all incredibly well-written and very intellectually written, right? Whether it's thematically or just structurally within like, the confines of what story should be and how to present it. But as a director, this dude levels up for me in the brood. He really nails it. He's got great, great people performing, by the way, shout outs to the grandpa, right? When he's calling yeah. him drunk, who, by the way, goes to his dead ex-wife's house to get super drunk on bourbon. My bad, probably <laughs> Canadian whiskey actually. And, uh, he gets super fucking drunk on some fucking Canadian whiskey and then just staring at his the chalk outline or the tape outline of his dead ex-wife. And then he calls the dude up. He's like, let's go get these bastards tonight, bro. Let's fucking do it. He kills it. <laughs> I, I actually really like this film. I think that it has a great pace to it. And it's the mystery, right? To me, when I first watched this film, it was the mystery. And when I got to watch it this week with, with Jamie... She had never seen it before. So I was watching the mystery develop with her. So she's asking me questions and I'm like, I can't answer that right now. But being able to, you know, when you watch a movie with someone who's watching it for the first time that you love, that you've dissected, that you've thought about, you're kind of re-experiencing it, right? So to be able to re-experience that mystery and not knowing what's going on until you kind of piece it together. And I think all of us, I don't know how y'all's experience was, but for me, like I kind of pieced together what was going on but not quite to the extent when she lifts up that shit, bruh, and the special effects, I love it. And even though, yeah, it's kids with hammers beating adults in the head, it doesn't feel like it should work in real life. But in the movie, they have a gravity to it. That scene with the teacher in her classroom, there's a gravity to that, right? And any other, if they remade this movie today, she lives. She shows up yeah. at the end. Oh, she's okay. It's whatever. If the dudes who did Scream 5 and 6 did this movie, <laughs> most of these people would still be alive. But Cronenberg had balls. Not balls on his throat, 
but balls cinematically. Maybe balls on his throat cinematically. I don't know. But I love the style of this film. I love the look of it. It looks raw. It doesn't look super clean, but it also doesn't look super cheap to me. And I have the Criterion Edition right here, which has a really nice transfer. I'm sure a 4K is out, maybe. I don't know, but I really like this film. I like the way it's put together. I think the style and structure of this movie is damn near brilliant. What do you think, Jelani? It's all right. It's it's I'm doing one of Brooks's because it's it's fine because the practical effects are amazing. Like for for the reveal at the end with the mom and you're just looking at it and you're like, what is that? What is that? Why would that happen? You know, <laughs> how is she like the perfect thing? And on top of that, man, why in the hell did he not like either kill or put those things in cages or lock them in the barn? How did they get like free reign in tracksuits? You know, how does that happen? Well, he you doesn't know, piece it, together that they're killing these people until like a certain moment. Like there's the, the moment, like once he realizes that they're, they're re like, he may be responsible for this shit. He like, he, he takes a face turn, right? He kind of does. Cause there's that weird moment where he like kisses the chick too. Right. And you're like, wait, well, what's going what on here? I'm so weird. What this is so are. weird. Yeah. And it's like, and he's like, I love you. Cause he's going to make, she's going to make him millions. So he's like, she's growing kids out of her body without sex. You know? <laughs> All it's I've done is dry hump this woman and she has spawned out all these fucking kids. These <laughs> it's the best. Uh oh, the second you had a first one, you're like, A, kill it with fire. B, kill it with fire. It's so much work. Like, I'm not I'm not seeing seven or eight of these things, and they're like, oh yeah, here you go. Here's a, here's a Teletubby suit for you. Until you ready suit for you. <laughs> oh hell no! There's just too much going on, and of course, um, it's it's. It, I'm sorry, it is too slow. It is it, there's this pace for, and it's probably because of the the new attention span that we have now. I don't know what it is, but I I, I probably want things right now. Even though I love slow burn movies and slow right. burn movies, I love those things. But this was a little too slow. Like you're you're telling me things, yes. And you understand, I'm understanding that the, the father is getting the daughter away from the mom because she's insane and rightly so. But you're not, and you're, they're not beating me over the head with it. I do appreciate that. But I think, I mean, and it, oh, yeah, another thing is mercifully short. So you don't get like, you have to wait like three hours like you do in movies now because yeah. this would be three and a half hours long. I just looked up the running time of Saw X, by the way, to plan my Friday out two hours, mm -hmm. and yeah. I was just like, what the fuck? Why is Saw X two hours? There's no All reason right. for that. There's, There's no reason for that. It's 30 minutes you can just cut out. But yeah, it, this movie is, it, and for me, it's paced, right? it's, it's just it is too long for what it is, what you're, what you're doing for the reveal. The very okay. beginning is good. The very ending is good. But that middle all of that in the middle, you need to work on that. There's just something <laughs> in there that's, I mean, it, it's put together and I see the pieces, but I see the pieces, I'm like, just put them together. Just do this. You know, uh, people are dying. You find the first midget and you're not calling nobody. You know what I'm saying? The first <laughs> little midget. Person, little person, Jelani. Little, little person. Little person. <laughs> Term. It doesn't matter. I'm an old person. Sorry. <laughs> Apologize to the little person community for calling oh me a bitch. <laughs> He's in the old defense, I see. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Do not old cite man. the old magic to me. I wasn't there when it was man. written. Right. Oh, there. All but, right, Jelani. I all right. Wow. You think this is that what you think? <laughs> okay. That's it. And the kid wasn't that horrible. Like I was saying before, Vern, the kid wasn't horrible. I think the kid was terrible, to be honest with you. Like, I just like, like I get that the kid's act is supposed to be acting catatonic and shit. They're lucky they got that kid because that kid can't act herself out of a fucking paper bag, bro. I'll be honest. With you. <laughs> a five year old child. Yeah. I don't give her. I don't give her shit. Now the the kid from like Santa's little Santa's little helper. Fuck that kid. <laughs> yeah, but more so. <laughs> I would fuck his sister. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> Speaking of fucking sisters, Verno, what do you think about the style oh and structure God. of this film? 
<laughs> how do how did how do I do the Pornhub uh, drum roll? I, fuck, I can't do it. All right, um, uh, <laughs> I mean Cronenberg is one of those guys that you have to you almost have to be really paying attention to appreciate how good the film looks sometimes because he's so subtle. He's never flashy about anything. But uh, yeah, it, it's a beautiful looking film. There's a lot more suspense in this movie than there is in Shivers and the Brood, or I mean, uh, Rabbit. So that I really appreciate. Like it feels in a lot of ways, it's structured almost like a slasher once it gets into the middle chunk of the film. But also that's the chunk of the film that I don't love because the if it, it's going to feel like a slasher that came out before Friday the 13th and in between Halloween. So there's not a lot for it to base itself off of. There's not like the kills that entertain me in the way that a slasher would. And also the other thing is like someone said it in the chat earlier watching it on a second viewing like the first viewing i think the mystery did keep me more engaged it had to have kept me more engaged this time knowing where it came it's weird like i can watch scream ten thousand times and that's a mystery and i'm fully engaged every time so it's not like mysteries can't do that or movies that are being mysterious but this like I, i'm not interested in the mystery i don't get wrapped up in it again i'm not feeling and it's because of the lead guy even though i like him like in Scream, you're still feeling those characters, you're invested in them. They don't know what the fuck's going on, so you feel like you don't know what's going on. I'm never fully invested in him, so I'm not as intrigued in the mystery aspect of it, I guess. But He's kind of plain. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess Jelani said a lot of what I feel. Beginning and structurally, I love the middle. I think it's too slow. It's one of those things, like, I don't feel like there's enough that happens in the middle that, like, stands out to me that I remember. If for good things like the teacher's death, like I don't to me, that's fairly on the whack side. No offense, but it doesn't do it for me. It's corny. Plus the sound design in that bit. I was listening to it with headphones on. Did anybody else listen to it with headphones on and notice what I noticed? No, At no, one no, point, they're like, do that, bro. They tell these kids <laughs> fable does you listen to shit with headphones on all the time. Because um, he's uh, trying to hide it from his kids, man. <laughs> Come on. They're, you've, they must have told these kids like, hey, sound sad, like sob and stuff. And it's like they're just using like the same sob, huh, 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 like over and over. It's the most awkward sounding sign design I've ever heard. But anyway, that's my bit. <laughs> okay, I, I can I can vibe with with the sound design aspect, even though I didn't listen to it in headphones. I I, I respect what you two have said, but I I just want everybody to know I firmly disagree. Uh, but it's okay. I still love y'all. Still love you. Um, it ain't Funhouse. So no, you're it's good. not. You're good. I feel like it. I feel like it right now with you two speaking. Brooks, what did you think about the style and structure of this film? I thought it was pretty good. I mean, it, I feel it does drag a little bit, but you know, that's kind of that's kind of the thing about suspense movies is like they have to slow down a lot, you know, to to build up the suspense. But uh, you know, like I said, it, it does have like some really good striking visuals, especially like the uh, the end scene where she cuts the uh the little baby thing out of her like tumor sack or whatever <laughs> i was like even i was like cringing a little bit at that scene and you know i've, I've seen i've seen some things these days <laughs> but uh yeah it's like i think you know i i wouldn't say i, I like it as much as i liked the video drone but i can see but it does definitely have the same style as like you know i could I could believe, you know, this is the Cronenberg, you know, you can tell the Cronenberg style is in this movie, you know. It this, just feels like, you know, an earlier version of it, I guess. Yeah, this is where it really starts kind of developing, right? This is where mm -hmm. it's in the birthing sack on the outside of Cronenberg's fucking <laughs> chest before he goes inside of that and pulls out a fucking handgun, right? <laughs> but uh, yeah. now I would say I, I think Video Drum's a better film than this. I think that The Fly is a better film than this. But to me, it's still like, I, I, I love this film so much, y'all. And uh, I feel like like everybody's saying positive things about the movie overall, and I still feel hurt because I love this film so much. But it's okay. Fable, hurt me some more. Kick me in the ball sack with my throat, please. Oh, man. Well, I think this movie has, has a lot of style. Um, there's a lot of um, good direction going on here. Um, uh, solid acting. Um you know, uh, visually, like you said, all, all the prosthetic stuff that happens, all the creatures, um, I think they look great. Um, you know, there's little subtle directing things like when he's looking for his child 
and she he thinks she's in the bed and like the cover is like covering the kid and he pulls the cover and her face is there and you know it's just this little stylistic stuff that he's doing with his direction that you can tell he's just getting better uh with this movie but um structure is where it fails for me because like i said it, it is slow and uh like like uh when the when the creature first comes in first of all it's like what the hell is going on now like what the hell is this like there's a whole other element to this movie that just got introduced right like this this psycho little creature which i thought was the little girl at first i don't know if you guys thought that yeah you know, i like, did kid. I, I, I thought I was the kid like, was a part of it I yeah, thought it, it was like know, turn it into the thing. Yeah, the first time I watched it, I was like, "That's the kid from fucking Poltergeist, bro." Is it yeah. connected? <laughs> Is this a prequel to Poltergeist? Yeah, she had the same ski suit, and they had ski suits. So I was just like, "Oh, oh, wait a minute, Is this little girl." She's you know what I mean? Kids. But yeah, yeah, and and it was really good. Like it was that was like a really intense moment when that happened when that when that creature first shows up. But then it just that's it. For like 20 minutes or at least 25 minutes before these creatures show up again. And I'm totally interested now in these damn creatures. Like, I want to know what the hell's going on there. So, you know, structure-wise, um, it, it, it's still not there yet. You know, video drone and with scanners and stuff like that, it, it starts to solidify more where, like I said, where he gets to the fly. And now we're talking about a perfectly paced movie. You know what I mean? But but he still has trouble with his pacing because even in Shivers, I feel the same thing. The same exact thing. It's the same way. It just uh, drags on a little bit and then all of a sudden it hits you with the lore. And the lore is a little crazy too. Like it's like, oh, psychodramatic babies and two, you know, all this <laughs> yeah. weird freaking thing that he, this idea that he comes out with. Like it's a great idea, right? Like we love it. It's Cro Cronenbergian idea. But it's just it's just the way he deals it out. It, it, it's not there yet with him. You know what, Fable? I can respect that and not say that I fully disagree. <laughs> See how he did that, Jelani and Verno, and he did it without hurting my feelings. There you go. All I had right. to get another rewind. I don't know. I don't know. All right, you know what? It is it. fun house. I'm taking it back. <laughs> <laughs> Jelaine's gonna be like zero, you digs. All right, yeah. Link. What do you think, man, about the style and structure of the film? Uh, style stylistically, I think it's get that in spades. Um, I forget who said it, but I, Fable, Verno, Jelani, uh, Robbie, Brooks, correct <laughs> me if we're the same thing. Um, <laughs> No, it's like he's he's subtle with the style. Like there's some like deep, rich colors in this. He's you know he likes to use colors for specific things, so I appreciated that. And there's like a, a like there's certain cool camera angles too. Like like when the um I think it was the stepmom, the mother-in-law was the first one to get killed, and the little girl she's like sitting on the couch, and it's like you know the camera cuts to like the kitchen, but it's like she's walking towards it, and like she it like. She's getting to the door, the camera's, you know, it's facing her back. And just as she's opening the door, you know, you think you're gonna see the shot of the lady dead on the ground, girl's gonna cry, but no, what's it do? Cuts the anticipation and it. it's a shot of her face. So it still doesn't reveal. I mean, she sees it, but the visual reveal, the, the satisfaction, the gratification of that isn't revealed. I kinda, I don't know, I dug that. I thought that was cool, but, um. Pacing wise, I I agree with you guys. It was it didn't bother me that much that it was so I guess I kind of got that it was gonna be kind of like a slow burn, so I was in for the ride. But I do agree. I feel like it could be like like you said, the lore's dropped in at the very end, and you know you're left to do. It's cool that you can think about that afterwards, but it's like a little bit of that could have been interspliced throughout the rest of the movie to make a, a smidge more engaging. Right. But I appreciate it. That was very nicely put, Steph. I really appreciate what you said about <laughs> some of the movie's stylistic ideas and, and even the structure. And I get what you're saying, but I, I just, the one thing is I, I love that they don't, I, I don't even think they fully explain it all, right? Like not through exposition or nothing. And I love the idea that Cronenberg's like, no, nah, the audience is smarter. They, they're they not going to get my movies. And if I don't have a smart audience, I don't give a shit. Right. And like, and maybe I just like, like I met Brian Polito this week. Name drop. You're kind of stupid. 
No, I'm not. I'm not saying. That. I meant Brian Don't you kind of said to us. Don't you kind of said to us. <laughs> I, meant, well, <laughs> I met Brian Polito this right, week. Baby. And I said, and, and he's the creator of Lady Death, Evil to Ernie, right? Chaos Comics. And I was like, what I've loved about you is you always did it your way. Regardless, right? I think David Cronenberg has always done it his way, regardless. And he was like, I, there's an audience I want. They'll find me. Right? right. And it took a while to get studios to have faith in him. And I don't even know if they really have faith in him now because he's, <laughs> he's, <laughs> Cronenberg is, he did Dead Zone, right? Right? Dead Zone. The, the very first movie I think review that Verna was ever on with me was Dead Zone, maybe. Right? Mm -hmm. And that is not the greatest Cronenberg film. And it's the most un Cronenberg film of all the Cronenberg films, right? And, he could easily, uh, he got dead zone. That means he's getting like Stephen King licenses. Like, right. Like people are like, you know, optioning Stephen King novels and they're, they're giving it to him. He could have gone in a certain direction, just like a John Carpenter. Another thing, I think Verno said it, that Cronenberg's style is so good that he doesn't want it to be noticed. Right. He just does his thing. And John Carpenter does the same thing. Right. Like, there's not, like, a John Carpenter move that I can tell you about. Like, we can talk about Dario Argento. <coughs> oh, yeah, let's, like, let's have a fucking tracking shot for no reason, mm -hmm. right? Just to, like, amplify atmosphere. Cronenberg, Carpenter, these are, char these, are, these are directors that don't utilize that kind of stuff in a pretentious way. They're pretentious filmmakers, Cronenberg for sure, because he's a very intellectual filmmaker, yeah. right? And there is this idea, like... Maybe I was too dumb to understand this movie sometimes. You know what I'm saying, right? But like, I don't think the brood kind of gets right in there. I like it hits that sweet spot. Speaking of sweet spots, the music is a sweet spot for me. It's very Berman. We talk about that. Bernard Herman, my bad. I, Bernard Herman is very Bernard Herman. A lot of stuff at this time was, but it doesn't dwell too much into just doing psycho. It has its moments where it's doing the blank, blank, blank but very few. There's more of this like atmospheric buildup. And if they were using synths in this, it would sound like John Carpenter. It would sound like a John Carpenter score if it wasn't strings, but some kind of 80 synth, hmm. in my opinion. Um, I love the music. It's Howard Shore. He does a lot of Cronenberg films, including Videodrome, which I think is a masterpiece as far as like the sound score, because the score is like, it's not just trying to make good music or just trying to make memorable themes that get stuck in your head, right? It's actually trying to amplify a mood or tension, right? And I think he gets better, just like Cronenberg does, but I think this is like so a milestone moment for him as a composer. And of course, he goes on to do Lord of the Rings. What do you think about the music, Jelani? Yeah, it was, it was pretty good. Um, it, it it has a pace to it. It keeps up with the film, even the, except for the slow parts. Um, it, it does its job. Even even when the 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 lady is getting attacked, I like that music a lot. I don't know. I mean, I just I don't know. Just the, the fear and all the information. Although I'm throwing them kids off me, I don't know how they get up on me. I'm not. A, why you beat me with a little mini hammer? Anyway. Well, but Jelani, music. real quick, real quick, real quick. Do you think any of the kills in a Child's Play movie are stupid? Because those are the same <laughs> vibes I get in Child's Play 1 through 3, what? where I'm like, you you just got beat to death by a ruler? Get the fuck out of here. Yeah. Like a yardstick? Beat, like hand. you Boy, died hammer. by yardstick? Yeah. Come Only on. if I was like like asleep. Safety like scissors are coming at your ass, you know yeah. what I'm saying? <laughs> like, I'm not, I'm finger not paint. Be <laughs> by no hammer, no baby hammer by two little kids that be coming at me. It's your last day. It'd be little, it'd come at me, little kid. Anyway, <laughs> I'm sorry. It, it irritates me. It just Every time I see those that scene, I'm like, come on, clearly. You can like, I don't know, push them away <laughs> lightly. They're, they're, they're tiny. <laughs> you can just <laughs> come check. Anyway, music was fine. All right. Verna, <laughs> what did you think about the music? And uh, carry us on through, please. Yeah, I well, I'm glad you mentioned Bernard Herman because I'm glad that that's a guy that I've gotten familiar with his name because now I can be like, oh yeah, that's that's who they're doing. He's the guy that did a lot of Alfred Hitchcock's scores, and that's who this dude is clearly influenced by. I think it's I think it's really like classy 
sound. Like it really adds a, a level of, of sophistication to the movie. And there's there's like bits in the kill scenes, like Robbie was pointing out. He just straight does the psycho bit. It's re 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 like like a hundred percent. He's just doing that, which is dope. But it's always interesting to me, and this is something I notice more when I am watching a movie with headphones on, like I was today, is there's bits like when the dad is just walking the daughter to school, and they're really putting her on the bus, or they're walking by the school bus, and the same, like this really creepy, eerie music playing, like setting the tone throughout the whole thing. But yeah, that's what I got to say on it. It's it's really well done music, but it's a little, little old school, like Robbie was saying. It's more 70s, and it hasn't got into the influence of Carpenter, so it sounds a little dated, but in a very uh, well done way. What about you, Brooks? Well, like the one thing I noticed is that this soundtrack relies heavily on strings, which makes sense. You know, a lot of violin, a lot of cello. It uses a lot more cello, I think, in a lot of parts. It make, gives it kind of that ominous bass, you know, feeling to it. It works, in, you know, it works really well with this movie. You know, it's good for. Uh, uh, complimenting the suspense and like you know the mood that uh Cronenberg is trying to set so like no complaints for me soundtrack wise a plus Mr. Shore I'm sure you'll never make soundtracks to any other movies though this is it this is surely this is surely the end of your career uh, Fable. um I actually like this is probably like the second favorite thing about this movie is the soundtrack um, my first, of course, is the prosthetics and stuff like that, the practical effects. But um, second is the soundtrack. I think the soundtrack helps this movie a lot, a whole lot, um, especially during that slow burn during the middle because the music is so harrowing. Uh, you know, it, it makes you, it, like, the father is trying to solve this mystery, trying to get his daughter away from the wife, and the music reflects that. It's, everything he does is harrowing, like, you know, Oh, I gotta go to the cycle. You know, so you're like yeah, yeah. you're following it because of the music. So I think that did, uh, actually the music is probably the, the second best thing in this movie. That theme Great. that you were just doing, by the way, is is called Daddy. Oh, okay. just kidding. It's not. But I just make it <laughs> daddy. <laughs> daddy, 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 daddy. <laughs> I know y'all parents out there, you three of them here on the the panel. Like I'm sure you hear that often, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. You <laughs> know, not in the way I want to hear it. Anyway, moving on, moving on. Um, got weird for a second. Steph, Link, what did you think about the music in the film? Sorry, guys. I, I enjoyed it. I guess I am an echo chamber of the positive thing you, you guys said. I think it was a compliment to the movie. It, like uh, Brooke said, added to the suspense. I did particular, in particular like the uh, they relied heavily on strings. And Verna, what do you said? This guy was influenced by the dude who did Psycho. Yeah, th that's what Robbie had mentioned. And I was mentioning that I'm glad I now know that dude's name. But yeah, it, it wasn't him. He was influenced by that guy, I think. Okay. No, yeah, it's funny you say that because I definitely got psycho vibes from it, you know, with that, the very striking uh, tones, but um, I enjoyed it. I, you know, it's, it definitely complimented the movie. Hell yeah. You know, one of the greatest tragedies of horror cinema scores, and I've said this many times, is that Richard Band gets panned for ripping off Bernard Herrmann's psycho score, right, at the direction of Stuart Gordon, when Harry was it Med Men Frandini, right? Right, Men Freddy. Men Frandini. Men Frandini. That's all he did in those movies, but he has a, k k <sighs> and everybody thinks it's fucking brilliant. So anyway, I, I don't think it's it's I don't think it's a bad thing to be influenced by Bernard Herrmann because that is the standard of horror movie music for a long time until we got to somebody like John Carpenter. Right. right. No, nobody complains about, even if a score comes out tomorrow, that sounds like Carpenter. People are like, hell yeah, they're taking it back to the old school. Like nobody complains about that. Exactly. That's what we should have been saying with this movie. Of course we weren't, none of us were there. Not really. I was born in 79. You were, you were born, but like yeah, you it. weren't watching the brood in the movie. The <laughs> no, no. And if you were, no wonder you hate kids so much, Jelani. Anyway, <laughs> this movie's got a lot of themes. It's got a lot of stuff that it's talking about. It's a piece of art. It really is. Jelani, what's this movie speaking to you? What's the theme you picked up on? 
I think you meant, you mentioned it earlier. It was uh, how how divorce impacts children and how it, it well how it can break up a, a family or, or try to tear things apart, especially when there's a cult involved, and you get you know different different perspectives from you know a doctor a crazy kook doctor that's basically like I, I don't know scaring apparently babies out of people. <laughs> and, <laughs> scaring know. babies out of people just, that's, that's what it seems to be We're like hey let's just take this thing out but uh, if I ever had by the way if, if I ever had like uh, a practice like this where I would where I would try to get the rage out of someone like this I, I, I wouldn't do it in this way you have to be empathetic as a caregiver as a, as a part well I, as a psychology major, but did not practicing. But I can say this, it, you have to be empathetic and you have to use it to your advantage. The way I think Oliver, uh, Oliver was doing it, of course the absolute wrong way. Like, and of course you're supposed to lock those kids up, but it tears apart families. Like he was getting to the point, like, I understand why he didn't want, you know, the parents to see her or anyone to see her because a she's batshit crazy b she's got shit growing out of her <laughs> so <laughs> you don't want to see her <laughs> so like yeah she's in the middle of her therapy she's too busy raging out babies but it, it it still tears apart families it still makes you know uh, i don't know it, i see why cronenberg decided that this was a good idea to to put his, kind of his life out on blast, yeah. And then of course, be the personification of his of his wife to be, uh, you know, a, a kind of a monster. Well, if you were making monster. a movie about your divorce, right? Wouldn't you have your that's, that's how your, it works. Your divorcee like be like just batshit fucking crazy, <laughs> yeah, you know she'd be crazy shit. shit growing out of her, fucking shacking up with the fucking pseudo doctor and all this kind of stuff. But one thing right. that I do love as an allegory or as a as a a statement on divorce what better way to show such a division in the two parents than one being a part of this like new agey new wavy kind of self-helpy cult and one being a very practical down to earth grounded kind of fucking person right it like shows a really cool like split because that's what happens a lot of times mm -hmm. with whether it's divorce or whether it's just breaking from a partner like Sometimes you just grow in very different ways. And 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 it seems like your other person your your partner is in a fucking cult and part of some kind of weird fucking way of thinking or something like that, right? So it's definitely talking about that, how it affects the adults, how it affects the children as mm -hmm. well. What about you, Verna? What's this movie speaking to you? What do you pick up on it? The, like I said at the start, it's I've never seen a Cronenberg film that wasn't super interesting thematically. That's like I think his strength as a, as a writer and a director is writing it and then conveying it through his direction. But, and there's a lot of them. Like I literally have a list over here. Like I start taking notes throughout it, like little things under a theme column. I've got a list of like 10 different things, but I think the key one to me is just like a violence begets violence or a generational trauma type of thing. Cause that's where it all comes from. Like you can do something to somebody, you can push some guy on the street and who knows where that's going to lead to. But basically the mom in this, her mom abused her. So you've got that pain that got per into her daughter and she's not dealing with it properly. And the whole idea of it, her inner pain that started from this violent act manifesting itself into actual violence and actual going out into the world now and <laughs> inflicting harm on other innocent people. And, that, you know, it's it's. It's all right there, and it's super fucking interesting. But, I mean, there's a lot under the surface that is going on in almost every theme. And I honestly think, for me, it almost... Maybe if I, like, the third or fourth time I watch this, when I'm not dwelling so hard on the themes, I'd be able to enjoy it more. Because I think that's what it is. I, I end up spending large chunks of this movie in my head thinking about the ideas and not being wrapped up in the movie. But thematically, it's a fucking brilliant movie. I love that you mentioned that. And... One thing that I will say is that this movie, it deals with that, but it also deals with this idea of the idea. It also deals with the idea of the idea <laughs> that maybe like this psychology that was happening at this time, this idea of repressed memories, 
right? And psychologists coming in and pulling repressed memories out. A lot of people still today kind of like debate the validity of some of that stuff, right? And that moment where you were talking about violence begets violence, and this is a generational thing because we see the parents of the parents going through their shit. We get a little bit of information about their stuff, but it's very ambiguous. We actually don't know if, if the mom of the brood was abused or mm. if that's something that was pulled out of her through a repressed memory that's not actually true. And this is stuff that happens. Jelani's been studying psychology. That's what he went to school for and all that shit. You were a counselor for a good long while there professionally. Mm -hmm. Like you understand that people in vulnerable states, they can sometimes, sometimes conflate things and mesh things and create memories actually. Mm -hmm. So that a lot of people will propose that repressed memories or maybe created memories. One of the things structurally about this movie that I love when the mom is giving the, I like, she's being accused of abusing her child at the beginning of this film, right? And she says, I'm not abusing my child. I was abused. And then you're getting the her mom, the grandmother, right? You're getting her telling, well, that never happened. Blah, 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 this. Now, gaslighting's a real fucking thing that happens, you know? And I've dealt with that shit, whether it's, especially in a family situation where you're like, no, this happened. And everybody's like, no, that didn't happen. Yeah, this fucking happened, right? So it's it's this, it's this a weird area that Cronenberg's existing in, in this moment. But he's also, what I, what I guess what I'm getting at is, first of all, structurally, I love that. And I watched some show and they were like, this is better. This is almost like Brian De Palma's split screen thing, the way they were cutting that together, but like a little bit more effective because they were actually cutting it in a suspenseful manner where like these two different stories of the same thing are happening to justify one person and then to justify another person. And then the way it ends, it's just, it's really interesting. Right. Mm. So I think there's a lot of like exploration on the idea of self-help psychology being very much. What's the word? What's the word I'm looking for? It's, it's very much for the individual and not for everybody else. Right. It's to make it's to make the, the, the patient feel good, but not actually to help the patient overcome integrate into problems. overcome yeah. the problems and actually exist in the world. Right. Like it's almost like a, a self-indulgent type thing sometimes where it's almost like going to one of those churches. No offense to anybody that goes to one of these churches, but going to one of these churches that just is like feel good shit. You know what I'm saying? Instead of like getting to the heart of the fucking matter and. I think that that's a really cool theme that's developed in this film is the harm of self-help. Like when your psychology and stuff is so much focused on you and not your connection to other people. No psychology, like therapy, counseling that needs to develop how you can relate to the rest of the world. Not just about what the world has done. To you. Yeah, the world's done us all shit. It's all kicked us in the balls in the throat. You know what I'm saying? However, how do we overcome that? How do we relate to the world after that? I think the movie's making a statement on that. What about you, Brooks? What do you think the movie's saying to you thematically? Well, one, one of the things I, I, that I thought was pretty obvious in the movie is the need to, to be able to let go of your daddy. And it's kind of, it's mirrored too, in a way, because like, you know, you have uh, this character, this, the guy who was in the first like session or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, he's like, he was trying to basically, he wants to, he tells the main character, could you be my daddy? You know, this guy is like, the way, like, when I think of a good father figure, I think of somebody who's, like, there to support, you know, and up to a point and, like, doesn't want you to just, like, lean on them, but wants you to eventually be able to, like, walk beside them, you know, who doesn't want you to just, like, constantly have to feel the need to please you or, you know, to uh, make you feel better. I think a bad father figure is one who just, like, who constantly try to make his son so reliant on him that he never really grows up. He just is constantly... Like, you know, in his father's shadow, constantly, you know, you know, just like, you know, begging and like, you know, being extremely pathetic. And like, you know, that's the way some people are like that. You know, some people need, feel, feel like they need like this strong father figure. And that's how a lot of like, you know, con men like this, the guy that this, uh, this uh, psychologist, I guess, or whatever, is kind of like, he's kind of somebody who's kind of preying on these people's need for something that he knows he can provide them so that he can, you know, in turn control them. 
And then, you know, on the reflective side, you have this child who does need her father and whose father is like, you know, trying to be a good father in that way as well. You know, he's trying to be there for when she needs it. But then you also have, you know, he's confronted with this guy who's like so dependent on having a father figure that he will just, you know, basically beg anybody to take that role on for him, whether, you know, he's he believes it or not. Like even says like, you know, oh, my real daddy, he's not, he, he can't be my father because, you know, he can't fill that role. Like, cause for him, like the father is, isn't just like, you know, the guy who is biological father, his daddy is somebody, he is like a, a role he needs to be filled. I but you gotta love... let go eventually, you know, you gotta learn to walk on your own as well. Yeah. So that you're not, you're not, you know, beholden to your father, but you are his equal, you know, so you can like, you know, meet each other as adults. I love that. And that's that's totally there's so many themes in this movie. It's a myriad <laughs> of fucking thematic material. And this is a movie about fathers. Oliver Reed is a father figure to these people in this therapy, for good or for bad, right? It's a movie about the father of the mother of the brood who was ineffectual and divorced his wife instead of dealing with the issue, right? And left Right. And he's dealing with that kind of guilt. That's why he's drinking. That's why he's so wrapped up in it. Right. It's a movie about the father of Candy. Candy's the name of the, co- the kid. Right. Because I kept cracking up and I kept going like Candy's nuts. Candace, Candace <laughs> Dick. I kept like throughout the whole fucking movie. I just kept doing that man, in my head, man. I love it. <clears throat> but it's a movie about fathers. Holy oh, shit. Family. It's a movie about David Cronenberg. <laughs> it's a movie about David Cronenberg dealing with his divorce. And not being necessarily, because a lot of people read into this movie, a lot of like misogynistic hate on women being these terrible things, reproductions, a gross thing to fucking view. And Cronenberg's like, no, this is about my insecurity about me being a good father during a divorce. Oh, do you see that? He's worried he's going to be like the, 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 the father who got killed, the grandfather. He's worried about that. He's worried about being the manipulative father like Oliver Reed just out for his own game. He's worried about being the like the father who's trying to to get what's going on but can't. He can't save his daughter because of the system, right? Like there's a lot of shit about fatherhood in this movie to unpack and we barely scratched the surface. Fable. Speaking of scratching surfaces, this dude Marble. Every time he sees Marble, he just goes up and scratches it for no reason. Why did I say that? <laughs> I have no idea. Fable, what do you think about the theme of this movie? What's it speaking to you? I prefer to stroke the furry wall, my friend. <laughs> yes. <laughs> stroke it. Same. Uh, 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 yeah, I think you guys hit it with, with all the father and, and the divorce and, and the stuff like that. But I, I'm going to say that this is actually Cronenberg's feelings or statements on just women in relationship um i think this is him lashing out you know you said it was misogynistic and i got a very masculine you know feel from this movie like it is a man thing like it is is there's some masculine about this movie but i think it i think it's his anger towards the situation and what we all go through when we have these situations with women where sometimes we deal with some women and we say all women are crazy they're all freaking nuts, you know what I'm saying? And that's not true, right? Like that's not true. But when we're going through that, when we're we're lashing out and we're we 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 can't understand these women logically, like they don't make any sense to us. I think a lot of that is in this movie with the main character, the 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 wife. You know, she's like crazy, crazy beyond control. Like even the psychiatrist can't get what he wants out of her. You know what I mean? Um, her rage. The, the children she spits out, it's like using the kids against you. And it's a divorce situation, you know what I'm saying? Like, there's a lot of, for me, it's like his statement on, on what he went through mentally in it, you know? And the father represents the drinking. You know, I'm drinking, oh, I'm crazy, you know, come on, we're gonna, we're gonna get this guy, you know what I'm saying? The whole masculine, you know, there's a lot of facets of the male psychology in here. Yeah. in this situation, you're going through a divorce or something like that. I don't know what just happened to your audio, but it got so much better. Oh, yeah, that was crazy. It was like all of a sudden you had a fucking wow. <laughs> all of a sudden Whatever you were right here, bro. All of a sudden you're right here. Dude, you ever better now? 
No, you su- you sounded amazing. Mm-hmm. Dude, can I just say, because I was thinking before, you, that's a really good point. And I feel like that divorce impacted his future films because I was thinking about it before this. He All of his movies had female leads. You can debate it with Shivers, but it feels like that nurse character is the lead. Then in Rabbit, there's a female lead. And then after the divorce, it's male leads in The Brood and Scanners and Videodrome and The Fly. He's like, no, we've had enough of that. He's like, I'm only working. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, whether that's conscious or not or whether it's because of the divorce. Well, but it's I mean, interesting. Look, look, look at all the men in, in this movie. All the men in this movie are very calm. Mm-hmm. The father is very calm in the situation. The psychiatrist, he's very calm. Calm. Well, the Even dude when, looking for a daddy is not very calm, yeah, bro. Well, <laughs> well, that's that's like I'm saying. It's he a facet help. of of what you can go through as a man when you're going through these situations. But like I'm trying to say, like when you say the misogynistic tones, I think that's where it comes from a little bit because it's like, no, 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 we're logical, insane people. It's these girls; they're freaking crazy, right? Like, yeah, I think he's saying that a little bit, but you know, not not saying that definitively, just saying that as an emotion. A feeling, you know, trying to get it in film. I, yeah, I don't know if I'm saying that the right way. Bro. No, I, I, I pick up what you're laying down, bro. And like, this is about his anger over right. what was going, he was going through. Right. And, and he directs that anger maybe a little bit towards women, right? And, and like, I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is I don't feel that David Cronenberg is a misogynistic filmmaker. Right. But there may be. I don't think he hates women. But at this time. He may right. have had some problems with some women that may have carried on into a few films, right? Like, honestly, like when I start thinking about the video drum, I think of that mostly about the media, but I want to rewatch that and, and, and view it as his thoughts on maybe how women, like women, right? Like, in, like David, Debbie, Debbie Harry. So fucking smoking that movie. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. She's crazy. A little bit, right? But who's the crazy one in that movie? Maybe it's the dude. So like, it's also like he understands that theme, right? He understands that he's taking it out on on his on his ex wife, right? right? He understands he's taking it out on certain people, and I think he explores that. And I and that's what I love. I mean, you're right, man, one hundred percent. Yeah. By the way, you you mentioned when you mentioned the drinking of the dad. Made me think of the drinking of or the granddad. Made me think of the drinking of the grandmother, right? Can we appreciate the structure of her whiskey glasses filled to the fucking brim <laughs> in that yeah. fucking movie while she's babysitting? Anyway, <laughs> and maybe yeah. maybe um maybe I relate to it a little more because I I'm I had my first relationship. My son's mother took my son away at six months old, and you know what I mean. I thought she was not in the right state of mind so like i don't know i felt like him i guess and whatever he was feeling he put it into this movie yeah no shit and the worries that come with that right like the worries of like am i I a bad person because of this am i a bad father and should i allow the mother to continue to to go along this route or should i actually step in should i do this am i like oh dude what this is the best part of the conversation so far (laughs) steph no no pressure (laughs) <laughs> what do you think this movie speaking to you? What do you think this movie speaking to you? Uh, uh, you know, a little bit about like regret and remorse. I guess I didn't know he was like dealing with a divorce when he was going through this, but like to me, the dad kind of um, you know, he was he was kind of upset that he wasn't equipped to deal with his wife's situation, and you know, and the the monster that developed because of that, you know, he I uh, but he you know he he he. To me, you know, he didn't seem like he he didn't want to divorce her, but he just wasn't equipped to deal with that. And like sometimes you enter things with the best intentions, not you know, you know, not realizing red flags, or you're just trying to overlook it, uh, over overestimating yourself, and um, sometimes bad happen, bad things happen from good intentions. But uh, he uh, he felt bad about it, you know, and he kept trying to you know get his girl, whatever troubles happen you know so i think a little bit about regret and remorse or not being equipped for situations even though you intend to it's a very real theme bro. And what you guys yeah it's a very real theme in our lives too because there are many times where we get into relationships we fall in love with someone we want to be there for them sometimes we just can't right mm-hmm. and it, it will hurt you to realize that i'm not equipped for this I can't deal with this. 
That's what the song Losing My Religion by R.E.M. is about. <laughs> Just so everybody knows. that That's what that's about. It's about realizing that you can't keep up with a partner. Someone you love so much and you wish you could. And and it's never... And the problem is we 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 internalize that and we think it's something wrong about us. No, it's not something wrong about us. It's not something wrong about them. Just sometimes people change. People grow or people don't grow. Sometimes you're just no longer equipped to handle it. And the best thing to do in those situations, as painful as it may be, and as complicated as it may be when there are children involved, sometimes the best thing to do is just to be like, I got to go. I can't handle this. We're both lesser people because of this relationship, right? But it deals, you you will deal with a lot of self-doubt and self-hate over that kind of shit. And I know plenty of men and women who deal with self-hate, self-loathing, and are in self-destructive patterns because they feel like they did something wrong. And maybe the best thing they did was end the marriage, right? It's rough. It's rough. It's a rough spot to be in. I think this movie goes beyond relationships, though. I think this movie goes into the relationship we have with our selves, with our emotions. And I think this movie's really talking about everything that we talked about here. But on top of it, our trauma from when we were kids, the stuff we saw our parents do, the stuff our parents did to us, the stuff that happened to us that nobody believes or people gaslight us into thinking didn't happen, right? There's that. But then there's the trauma that we deal with as adults, going in and out of relationships, having children, having relationships with our kids, right? I don't have any kids, but my cats, it's been up and down this entire time. (laughs) No, not... I'm not trying to take away from any of that, but this is about what trauma does to you physically as well. There's so much mental stuff going on in this film. So much mental stuff going on in every Cronenberg film, but he deals with body horror. So Cronenberg likes to talk about what's, what's actually physically happening to you as well. How that relates to what's happening here. As above, so below. What does that mean? Oh, some esoteric statement about the stars uh, uh, guiding our lives. No, what that means is what happens here, happens here. What you think about, you bring about. What you talk about, you walk about. As within, so without, right? That's what as above, so below means to me. It means that your mental space has a physical reflection. It has... Psychology has an effect on your physiology. It is a real thing. It's documented, right? They go, they stretch it further here, right? Oh, Where this dude's actually bringing out boils, cancer of the fucking ball sack throat, right? He's bringing out like babies in this fucking person. But it is about the physical manifestation of undealt trauma or misdealt trauma. Because this dude... He's a doctor. He's not necessarily a charlatan. By the end of the film, we find out he had the best of intentions, right? But at the same time, he's a little bit of a mad scientist as well. So there's that idea in there as well. It's a tiny mad scientist theme. A lot of Cronenberg... Cronenberg likes mad scientists as well. Think of The Fly. That's the ultimate mad scientist film, right? It's, it's about, to me, the stuff that we deal with, and when, and they say this straight up in the movie, If you don't deal with it, it manifests itself physically. How does the movie end? The movie ends with the kid having a growth. The cycle continues. That's generational, like we talked about. It's about the sins of the fathers or the mothers or whatever. It's about the perpetual perpetual nature of trauma, right? Like grandparents give it to the parents. The parents give it to the kids. The kids are going to give it to their kids. It happens. I deal with a lot of the same issues in my personal life that my family dealt with. Why? Because that was ingrained into me and it comes out in an actual way. And physically, man, like you ever had a stressful day, you come home, your neck's tight, your calves are tight. You just need like some touch. You just need some love. Like you're just like fucking clenched up. You're bundled up. 
what happens here manifests here, y'all. So maybe one of the ideas is if you take care of this, you can take care of this. But you got to take care of this first, in my opinion. You got to deal with everything that that happened to you in your life. Because it's going to, if you don't deal with it, it will deal with you. You know what I'm saying? It will grind you down. And I mean in a very real, physical, concrete way, right? You will, I know plenty of people in my life that are like 60 years of age. They seem like they're my age, right? But they've, they have such a level head. They've dealt with their shit. I've talked to these people. They, I, I take so many lessons from these people, right? Other people that are my age that look 20 years older than me, act 20 years older than me. They've never let it go. Every time I, I, every time I see them, they're bitching and moaning about the same shit. And they age quick. And they, they degrade physically. Trauma. Mental shit. That mental health is as important as physical health. It's connected. It's like space and time. It's the same goddamn thing, y'all. It's not separate, right? You need to take care of your brain and your emotions and heart just as much as you need to take care of your bar as your body. And if you don't, they're going to go out of whack and you're going to get fucked. That's what's going to happen. You'll be running around looking for your fucking daddy for the rest of your life. <laughs> we don't want that. <laughs> All right. Maybe one of the longest thematic discussions we've ever had, but definitely fucking worth it. Cronenberg, baby. Cronenberg. All right, baby. Speaking of Cronenberg, it's time to rate the film out of five possible you digs. You out there in the chat, what do you give The Brood from 1979? Head is nice, by the way, Perry. Um, <laughs> what the fuck? Uh, you totally distracted me. Anyway, Jelani, kick us off. Out of five you digs, what do you give? the brood that was a lot to unpack um thank you for that robbie i appreciate it um thank you brother you yeah. you started it <laughs> yeah, i didn't start much all i'm saying is this uh this movie i am mean, have a hard time watching it again but it's not bad i i, I i'd have to say i'll give this yeah this gets like a three you digs for me um it's not average it's just i it's not bad it's just kind of there and and it, the the practical effects are amazing like i said the, the beginning of this movie and the end of this movie are are textbook awesome you know what i'm saying like you, you actually he had to choke her like like kill her I, I, she had to go because she was gonna kill her you know her, her own daughter over this nonsense and you feel that there is a lot of trauma. There's a lot of things that, that you know, you can you get over it? Would this whole movie, bro, may be from it, the result of him hearing those words. I would rather her die than be with you. Like that's you. words that I know parents have heard from other parents during a divorce situation in, in particular or a custody battle. I have a dear friend going through it right now. It's rough, man. Yeah, it, it's it kind of sucks. But I, I get it, and it's that's what happens, man. You fall in love, you have kids, things like this happen. Um, it's the way life rolls. But this movie, yeah, this is some Cronenberg, man. Thank you for sharing Cronenberg with me again. So yeah, <laughs> we'll God do another it. one next year, bro. Don't worry. I can't wait. Three, three days. We do a Cronenberg every year until we're done, <laughs> bro. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> and don't worry, one day we'll talk about. Vigo Mortensen's swinging dick in Eastern Promises, no. man. Uh, there you go. Speaking of swinging dicks, Verno, what, what out of five you dicks, what do you give the brood? Uh, first, I want to say, I think Art Hindle, which is the lead in this movie, I keep meaning to say this. Does anybody else think he looks just like the young Han Solo guy? He yeah. looks just like I've that, heard dude. that, yeah. Aaron yeah. Aaron Wright. Aaron yeah, Wright. yeah I, I, did, I had to get that out, man, because he just... He it, does have first that, time yeah. I watched the movie, it was like, the whole time I had that guy in my head, but uh, I'm and right there with Jelani. Yeah, this is a weird movie to score because, especially the conversation we just had on the themes, it's it's so much better than a lot of movies that I'm I would give a three to. But it's just as far as my entertainment level, so far it's it's not there to where I want to give it a the three point five that I I feel like it could deserve. But I'll, I'll stick with a three. I don't know what it is, but uh, I will give it another 
shot. I was tempted to buy this thing before I rewatched it, and, and I don't know if I will yet, but it's on HBO. I'll, I'll give this thing another try eventually. I love how goddamn critical you two are being here on Horror Fest, but it's okay. It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> Three digs is fine. It's average. It's fine. That's not even a hero. It's not Funhouse. He thought me and Link was going to be Jelani and uh, and uh, Burn. <laughs> well, <laughs> let me say that's what's funny about it. Like Fable. I and honestly stuff. thought you all were going to tell me you love the fucking movie. It was perfect. <laughs> you guys know I really, really enjoy a slow '70s movie. Like even slower mm -hmm. than this. I love this shit. Oh, is it better than Kingdom of the Spiders? At least. Oh my god! I mean, bro, <laughs> what, uh, don't condescend to me by asking me that question. You know it is. <laughs> Hey, I'm sure it would be different if, in your mind. <laughs> we watched it in a drive-in. Anyway, Brooks, <laughs> what about you, my man? Out of five, you digs, what do you give the brood? I give this movie a four point five. It's Ooh. like for what it is, it's like it does it does what it does really well. Like I think this is a movie that could probably like you know become more like the more you watch it, the more you more the more you can appreciate it. But I, like on the, on the first watch, I really did enjoy this movie a lot more than I thought I was going to. Like, uh, I really liked, you know, a lot of the, the visual stuff in it. I think, it, you know, it's just like, it seems like, you know, uh, you know, I haven't seen too much Cronenberg yet. You know, I've only seen this one in Videodrome so far and parts of The Fly. But like, this feels like, you know, a good start, you know, for like a director, like, you know, having a movie like, you know, this, that just kind of really jump starts what you consider his career. So uh, yeah, it's not quite perfect, but still ex exceptionally good. Fuck yeah, man! I, I like that, Brooks. I I love you. I don't know if I've told you that recently, but I love you, Brooks. Fable out of five, you digs. What do you give the brood? Oh, uh, I'm gonna give this one a three. Also, well, you know what? I say it's a three. I would give it a three because um, it is a little pretentious. You know, it, it is Cronenberg being Cronenberg and, and really satisfying himself and not the audience, although he's getting there. Some of those scenes at the end, uh, you know, are very harrowing. The little girl, the way she's being pulled at by those creatures and she's screaming, the reveal of the mom and her stomach, the way it looks. And Jesus Christ, her licking that baby. I mean, that's one of the grossest <laughs> things I've ever seen. Yeah. I always wondered where that scene, you, you got that scene from in your intro. Oh yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. The horror show intro, and finally it, I, I got it. It came from this one. So, I, um, you know, being that it's horror fest and all, we're gonna go three point five, uh, on on uh, the brood, man. Station, fucking fable, understanding the spirit of horror fest. Thank you so much, man. You know the reason for the season. You know, you know the what? reason for the I season, fable. <laughs> nope, I've changed my score. My score is now point five. <laughs> oh fuck you, man! We're not allowing yeah, that tonight, bro. Yeah, you've already, fine. you've already, I already got you captured, man. You're fine. <laughs> nah, Fable, I appreciate, I appreciate what you're saying, man. It's uh, and that scene is crazy. And what's crazy is that Samantha, whatever her name is, she came up with that idea because mm. she had a lot of like puppies and shit growing up, like a lot of <laughs> animals. She was always around. She saw that behavior, like of licking the head of the baby, right? So can I just add some real quick with with Cronenberg? that I noticed watching these earlier movies. Um, yeah. I, I would say that the horrific science fiction, you know, just disgusting stuff that he tries to throw in these first few films are almost unnecessary. Um, these films, if you, if you just change those elements, they're still good films. It's almost as if they're unnecessary. They kind of complicate the film a little bit. His earlier films, I'm saying. Until he gets to the part where he actually needs to do it, where it's the fly. The context of the movie is to be that. Yeah. Um, you know what I mean? Or like video drama. He's trying to tell. It doesn't need the science fiction elements or the, the horrific elements because they're, 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 they're very little also. It can easily be changed. But, but yeah, I just wanted to add that, just studying his earlier films. Well, you know, you take all that stuff out and it's Kramer versus Kramer. To which Cronenberg said, this is my version of Kramer versus Kramer, but like more realistically, which is really fucking funny to think about that. He thinks this is a more realistic film, but he's kind of right. And on a emotional level, I think if you if you if you look back at that film and Kramer versus Kramer, by the way, is not about Cosmo Kramer from Seinfeld whatsoever. <laughs> Link, what about you out of five? You digs. What do you give the brood? 
I'm going to give it a solid 3.69 with it upon, you know, it's got rewatchability. Um, I, I liked stylistically. I liked the, there's a lot of themes to dissect, but, but I do think the pacing cannot be for everybody. You know, it, it's not, I'm not saying it's bad, but it's maybe it's like an acquired taste thing. Could it feel like it still could have been tightened up, but uh, 3.69 with a chance to increase. Okay. I like that. I like that. All right. For me, um, five, it's a five. You digs for me. I fucking love this film. I think it's his first brilliant film. I think it's his first perfect film. I think it's the first full on Cronenberg film. And I think from this point forward, they're all fives for the next like 10 years for him, but all for different reasons and varying degrees of such, right? Like I can rank my favorite Cronenberg films, and all five of those top fives would be fives. Mm. And The Brood would be up there. Do I think it's better than Videodrome? No. Do I think it's better than The Fly? No. I think it's better than Scanners? Yes. But regardless, I love this film. And I think it's the first time that an independent filmmaker from Canada really, really moved the bar, right? He'd been trying to do it. And I can't think of a more bold and daring and provocative and intellectual filmmaker from Canada. I'm sorry. I love Bob Clark too, right? But David Cronenberg is where it's at for me. So I'm going to give this one a five. Yeah, digs. So there you go. So oh, yeah. we have a three from Delaney. We have a three from Verno. We have a 4.5 from Brooks, a 3.5 from Fable, and a 3.69 from Steph. And I'm doing the actual math here. And we have a 3.78166666679. Everybody, that's what we're doing. All right. So let's just round that up to a 3.7. Eight sixty nine. Yeah. Sound good to you? All right, let's do that. All right, we gotta throw the sixty nine in there just for video drum. Um, <laughs> woo. Anyway, all right, man. What a great, great conversation about the brood tonight. Uh, went longer than the actual movie, and uh, that's yeah. a rarity during horror fest. But that's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Can't can't has been as bad as Leatherface, y'all. Okay, that that <laughs> movie was fuck fucking shit. All right, next week. Here on the channel, it's the movie that you chose for PCP Movie Night, y'all. We always do the audience choice where y'all pick some stuff to put out on a poll in the PCP Army on Facebook. Join the PCP Army on Facebook, by the way, if you haven't already. And the winner of that poll was Tales from the Hood. So yep. next week, <laughs> Tales from the Hood here on Horror Fest at your behest. But before that, Join Verno's show for A Quiet Place Part 2. I know you got Nick on that show. Oh, yeah, um, I think Steph. you have Steph on that show. Yeah, yeah. Is that When When is that airing? Is it airing on Friday or Thursday? Mm, you're doing uh, the monthly comic show on Thursday, so I'll drop it Wednesday. Ooh, dropping Wednesday, an early horror fest, y'all. A Quiet Place Part 2. In my opinion, hot take, better than Part 1. Boom. Wow. Better than Part 1. And then, then join me over at Dylan's Horror Show on Saturday. Y'all, I have not seen this movie since I was a kid. We're going to be talking about Wishmaster, which I loved as a kid. And I, I'm really curious to see how I think about it today. <laughs> um, but yes, we're talking about Wishmaster on Dylan's Horror Show. Also, though, don't forget, next week, Tales from the Hood, we are just in the middle of Horror Fest 2023, the biggest and grandest horror fest of all time over 50 movies talked about across three channels in over 30 shows it's going to be absolutely slam bang fantastic so wednesday night blood splatter chatter a quiet place part two saturday night dylan's horror show Wishmaster, and next monday here on pcp movie night tales from the hood another movie i have not seen since it first released oh, steph's gonna be there for that and a pcp debut of stew 
from Doctor Doom's fan club. So oh, that's yeah. gonna be fun. I hope he I hope he got his mic issues worked out. That was, but, that uh, was my <laughs> nomination, by the way, in the in the PCP. That Facebook. was your nomination. Yeah, I, I nominated it. And you're not even on the show. Hold on. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> you got to do your own like separate thoughts, and you can just send me in like a, a one minute clip, man. Perfect. Like being like, "Yo, this was my movie. I picked it. Thank you, dude. That's a good idea. Like whoever picked the movie, who wins the poll, should get like a, like a minute video, oh, yeah. like like little segment. So yeah, get on that, Verno. All right, one less short this week, man. But it's okay. You can do it. Right, it's all good. Um, anyway, y'all been doing great work. I appreciate everybody for being here tonight. Jelani, what's coming up, man? Final thoughts. Yeah, man. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, you know, freaked out by a Cronenberg movie, like usual. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, I enjoyed it either way. Uh, of course, Brooks and I do go figure reviews. We talk about it a lot. We did a Lady Slither review. Uh, and we also did Snake Mountain, but I haven't put out the Snake Mountain video that will come out probably tomorrow. But uh, Lady Slither is an awesome figure. You guys should mm-hmm. really like try and pick it up if you. Well, it's sold out, so you know, never mind. But <laughs> watch our review; it's gonna be awesome. You're That's like it. when we did Near Dark. We're like, yeah, watch it. You can't, but you should. But you should. Now, y'all do great work, man. Thank you for being here, Jelani. Verno, yeah. thank you for being here. Final thoughts, my man. My brother. Yeah, no, this was a, this is what I was happy to revisit. You already mentioned it, A Quiet Place too. Go check it out. Blood Splatter Chatter, having fun over at Horror Fest. Did the blah. We, also, yeah, if you're watching this one, we've said it. Go check out our discussion on Shivers because it's very similar, but picture me in Robbie's role. Trying to defend, like, trust me, guys, this is fucking brilliant. <laughs> it was a lot of that. <laughs> Hell yeah. I appreciate you, Verno, man. I love you, man. What about you, Brooks, man? Final thoughts. Well, to, to, to practice some of my freestyle, man. A cancerous brood is just no good. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> you might need to workshop that one a little bit, Brooks. <laughs> yeah, I thought, I'm sure that was a winner. <laughs> Usually it is Fable, my man. You got a you got a big show coming up, man. Why don't you tell everybody what's going on? And thank you for being here, man. Final thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. Oh man, Cronenberg films. Never, never regret watching them. No, uh, doesn't matter. I watch all of them, and they're all interesting, but to varying degrees. Um, and yeah, we're coming back on uh, October sixth, right? Seven. 7th, I think, brother. Seven. Why can't lock down the day? I don't understand. October 7th, we're making our, our YouTube debut, our premiere um, uh, uh, Saturday, the 7th, 1 p.m. Eastern. And our first guest will be Jennifer. Comics will break your heart. So it's going to be a great show. Um, if you know what what's uh, going on lately in the community, you're not going to want to miss that one. She's a great, great person that uh, we've known for quite some time now. So it's uh, kind of weird that we haven't had her on yet. But finally, she's coming on. She's going to be our debut guest, man. So tune in, man. Saturday, uh, October 7th, 1 p.m. Eastern. There we go. I got it. Nailed Hell it. yeah. <laughs> Looking forward to that, man. Jennifer's one of my favorite people in this community. We've had her on this channel multiple times and... I love her so much. She is absolutely a pillar of this community, right? 100%. The salt of the earth, some would say. Steph, love you, bruh. What do you think, man? What's uh? Thank you for being here. Final thoughts. What's coming up, man? I know you got a show you do every Wednesday. <laughs> yeah, it's a little show uh, called Supreme Clientele with uh, our, our good brother, Stu, Dr. Doom's fan club. Um. I did say, I think I said on the, Fable did a pop-up, and I think I said we were going to take a break, but I think we're going to do a show Wednesday. So either I or him will be hosting IG at 9, 9 p.m. Wednesday. So, Vern, when, when's your video? What time are you dropping it? Wednesday, brother. Wednesday. I, I don't know. Sometime Wednesday uh, evening. We pre-recorded that one because I'm going on a little trip. So keep an eye out for it. It'll be on Wednesday. I spent like 12 hours editing the thing. It's going to be pretty fire. <laughs> I hope so. That's all. <laughs> but yeah, Wednesday, you know, come check us out. Heck yeah, y'all. All right, you out there in the PCP Army, thank you so much for joining us for this review. Do not forget 
Horrorfest continues over at Blood Splatter Chatter on Wednesday. Maybe at some point, who knows? A Quiet Place Part 2. Be on the lookout for that. A Wishmaster. A Wishmaster. A Wishmaster Place. We're reviewing on Dylan's Horror <laughs> Show on Saturday night. And next week, Tales from the Hood with No Mike Stew. Very excited for that. It's going to be a great show. I appreciate everybody. I love you. This is the best panel we've had. All Horror Fest, in my opinion. I don't care about what Verno and Jelani, when they were shitting, like, like when you were like basically disrespecting the name of Cronenberg tonight, I didn't mind it. It was okay. <laughs> Verno, you said this movie True. was better than, was not as good as Shivers, and for that, I just, that hurts, bro. I don't enjoy it, it as much. It might I'll be tell a, you what, it's probably you, a better movie. You telling me that Shivers is better than this movie is you being. Now I'd like two eggs over hard. <laughs> like, wow you didn't have to say that like it's okay but whatever you know we all do what we do and we work what we work and that's why i love verno <laughs> what are you doing what are you showing i got shivers on blu-ray too motherfucker like what are you doing man what, what's got what's up shivers baby <laughs> shivers. <laughs> jesus christ all right you well, shivers? i love y'all so much have a good one join us next week man tales from the hood that's gonna be a Fucking interesting conversation. Uh, was station pop pop. <laughs> Ooh.